to the uh, penultimate, next to last event at the Tokyo Greek Festival. Um, we're finishing, as you know, uh, with these two events. We're very glad to have our wonderful friends and guests uh, tonight, Robert Levin, and tomorrow, both Yafe Chuang and Robert Levin. Um, we will not do more than a little stretch after the talk. Uh, I've been invited by Mr. Levin to replace him as the speaker tonight. Um, it's very hard to talk and play. Uh, I've had the experience. I, I never felt comfortable about it. He's right, um, though I'm sure he would probably have much more interesting things to say. There are lots, lots of things to say about this piece. Um, I wanted just to couple, make a couple of announcements since it is a, a, a sort of final event. We used to sell CDs. Now we give them away. <laughs> so on the way out and across the street, if you see something you'll actually play when you get home, it is yours. Uh, and uh, we are also going to be around at the end to speak with everyone, but the stand up and stretch will just be enough time for us all to take a breath before Bob starts. Uh, it will not be a formal leaving the area kind of stretch. It, so you see that in your program pause, it's rather brief. Um, Goldberg Variations was paired with the Bach Chaconne for Violin, a recent article in the British periodical, as the two most popular pieces of concert music in the world. Not a surprise, except it would be a big one to Bach, uh, because he was himself, as a composer through his career, not particularly interested in the writing of variations. Uh, the first period of his, of his composition included chorale prelude variations on the canonical Lutheran tunes. Um, part of his job, he used to probably at first improvise those as people came filing into the, to the church. Eventually he formalized them, publicized a couple of them. But they really stopped during his middle career period. Um, and variations to him generally meant uh, what we would call chacon, that is, the laying of all kinds of solutions and, and ideas upon a given baseline. Um, one of the pieces some of you probably know, a variation piece that came along in that early time, would be Cantata Four, Christlag and Todesbaden, which is a vocal orchestral version of the kind of thing he wrote for organ. Very, very distinct. Uh, ideas on the t top of the ground base of the, of the chorale tune. Um, the Goldberg variations are a surprise, and I think they occurred really because of his tremendous curiosity about what other composers are doing. He was a great ordering up of music from all over the world, and particularly uh, avid to know what uh, Handel was doing up in England. And uh, in 1733, which is quite a few years before the, the publication date of the Goldberg, he found a piece by Handel, uh, a suite in F major, which had a bass line that he obviously liked a lot. <laughs> straightforward variation movements in which the, the bass stays constant and the, the <coughs> improviser, now composer, invents various kinds of shapes above. And clearly it seemed like a moment for Bach to begin thinking again about variation. Now he doesn't publish the Goldberg variations until 42, which is very, very late. Uh, he publishes as the last part of the provocatively top title series, Clavier Übung keyboard practice series. Um, almost everything of Bach is published with something suggesting a pedagogical import as well as a musical one. Uh, and in the case of the Goldberg Variations, publishing in that format met uh, players beware. This is what you should be eventually be, but what you eventually want to be. Um, always pushing a little bit further out on that score. And you'll see that very much buried in the structure of the Goldberg is that same incentive, the building into the structure of uh, the toccata element, the, the sense of the player and the, and the 
two hands being absolutely fully developed. So this bass line, which you will be hearing over and over, I think it is the key to the popularity of the piece, particularly if you go back to the year 1955. I hope some of you were also around as I was. TV, people were buying TV sets. There was a sense of excitement in sort of the publicity around a gentleman named Glenn Gould, who walked into a recording studio at CBS and made an amazing, really quite amazing recording of this piece. And if you went to your friend's house in 1955, the people who didn't have much interest in concert music, they had one phonograph record, and they were playing it, and it was Glenn Gould playing Goldberg Variations. And it seemed like an anomaly, but it also sunk in rather deeply. There was something about the sheer feat of playing that piece, the sheer amazement of having composed it, that reached into a kind of part of the culture that really was not perhaps really expecting it. The piece really is about ground bass and bass line hearing. Why was an American audience really ready to hear it? I think it's because that was also the peak moment for jazz in the popular culture in this country. Oscar Peterson, Art Tatum, Errol Garner, they were never more important than 1955. The big bands like Basie, Ellington, Glenn Miller, they were touring, they were in every city in the country, and people who were enjoying jazz, whether they knew it or not, were hearing bass line as their means of understanding what jazz players were doing. And I think the American ear was hearing in the Goldberg Variation the same challenge. If we can hear in some way how this structure functions over and over in this piece, and taking the tremendous pleasure of the invention of the composers here, of being able to go through the sequence time and again and keep coming up with some kind of fresh imagination, that is a jazz experience as well as a tremendously powerful concert music experience. So I'm going to say a little bit about the pattern itself. It's never stated in the piece. The pattern is really extrapolated from its many, many rather loosely conceived appearances in the piece. It's almost always decorated to some degree. And what we have come to say is the basic thing is something that we, after the fact, have taken to writing down. It never really appears in this manner. The closest thing to its actual unvarnished sort of audible manifestation is right away in the aria. It's really never again in the piece going to be just those four notes without any additions. I should say, lest I forget, that Bob Levin is going to play the piece as written, that is to say, with all the repeats. You'll get plenty of chance to both enjoy the fact that you hear everything twice. You will hear some of it with embellishment, which is really probably the most authentic way to deal with some of these wonderful phrases. Particularly places that are not particularly busy, he will be adding something. But the piece is fully there. If it says to repeat, which it says about every half of this piece, he's going to repeat. This also gets around some of the most disputes about the recordings of this piece where the performers have chosen to repeat one section and not another, giving the critics a huge amount to do and protest about it. After the first downward... So it's really basic home key, somewhat challenged by moving to the pulse dominant and then back to its arrival. Okay, that's the first half of the piece, and that will repeat. 
the destination of the first half of the piece is what we call the dominant. It, it continues moving from the dominant, so the dominant area extends across what we call the double bar, but moves off into a different register. Destination is something new, what is called the relative minor of the key. Here's the key. Relative minor is the really the only area where that triad, uh, this one dominates. It tends to be a it's nodal point explicitly at each variation, uh, and the movement away from it tends to be a rather more turbulent and more intricate area because we're going to have to go from here back to the helm key. Actually, a couple usually of sequences, uh, taking it back to the home key, and the original, the original pattern is repeated in the bass. So once more, review first half. So the same cadence formula, this time in the home key, um, and the two halves are symmetrical. That is the. They are each uh, uh, the same distance in musical time. And the way it is filled is a kind of a marvel. Uh, the pattern, and I'll just express it to you because it's something that the first time through you probably won't take in. But if you go back to the piece, it is a source of tremendous fascination. From the very beginning, uh, he's going to display a bunch of canons. Canon is when something is played back as it uh, as itself in some form. That is a, I'll, well, the simplest version I'll play. Are the, are, except for this one, not going to be at the same pitch level. They're all, uh, the second voice comes in on a different note. Uh, the hardest canon to write is that one that we just heard, because the harmony doesn't move so well when the same thing is going to come melodically in such a contiguous way. But once the canon moves to a, half st to a step away, or it starts to become a more uh, of a goad to the harmony, and Bach revels in that. The structure of the piece soon becomes a, a set of three sections, always the same sequence. A canon, followed by a piece that I like to call an invention because it's, it's very much akin to the kind of sub secondary movements of one of, of a Bach suite. Almost anything can happen, but they'll, they'll sound often like a minuet or like a, um, even, even like a kind of song-like piece. Um, and then the third thing is always going to be a takata, some time, some kind of a display piece. The third of the of the little group of three, and this is going to happen something amazing number of times with amazing variety. The takata is always that moment where both hands have to come into play, and one of the things that you're going to see and hear in this piece in an unusual way, even for a Bach piece, is how much the hands are doing this. One of the reasons for that is that the original design of the piece is not for the piano, it's for a, a instrument of more than one keyboard, with, in which the, the floating hand, or the, the passing hand, has a lot more room. So for years, pianists have played this piece somehow dealing with the fact that they are climbing over themselves, um, which is actually makes the Takata even more of a wonderful challenge than it is in some ways on the harpsichord. But that pattern of three, three, three goes all the way through the piece um, with one bold interruption that I'll talk about in a minute. But three, three, three meaning for Bach, of course, the Trinity, and meaning that he's writing also a piece unusually 
uh, devoted to triple time, that is to one, two, three beats in the measure, so that something about the Trinity is absolutely expanding uh, right. and being breathed into this piece. And we know that from the cantatas that both triple meter and triple uh, expressive issues and, and, and structural issues are very important to Bach. Uh, he believed that what he's expressing is not just a piece of music, but a fact that music is a kind of expression of cosmos and, and of the state of the universe. <coughs> and he was probably one of the last composers to be able in, in the scientific world and in the world of, of, uh, of literature and commerce to be able to hold such a uh, rapturous idea of the unity of art and, and, and science and, and the structure of the world. But I think we hear that in these threes and, in, and with the connection in Bach's mind, of course, to the, to the clear in his mind uh, religious significance of numbers. Um, so, um, Bach returns only once more to variation uh, it, it, in a very profound way at the end of his life, the von uh, Himmelhoff variations for organ. Uh, by then, he's another composer. Uh, he has really begun viewing harmony and counterpoint in quite a different way. And so we have at this point in the Goldberg Variations, at this very, very big moment of his career, the publication of the, of the Clavier Übung, uh, his state of mind about variation. That is that really almost anything can happen here. Um, and that within the structure, within the mystery of the privacy of the structure, is somehow something much wider than the piece, uh, representing, I'm sure, uh, some sort of unity with, with, with the world, which, uh, which he as a composer never lacked. Um, so we're very glad to have uh, Bob here to play this wonderful piece. And as I mentioned, you will be hearing uh, all of the repeats as they are laid into the structure. And I, you will also, I think, will be quite acute to find uh, that, that he will, in the old, the old way that very few can do now, uh, be adding a few notes of his own, uh, uh, which I think uh, always, I think, adds to the excitement of the, of the experience. Um, so, very glad that you're all here for this very exceptional experience uh, with, uh, with with our guest, Mr. Levin, and with our uh, our guest. Uh,